Welcome. We're going to be going through university physics from OpenStax. We're going to start with units and measurement. What we're going to do throughout the course of the semester is develop your skills um, and your, uh, your tools for describing the physical world and what happens mathematically so that you can actually describe motion and um, motion of objects in three dimensions and you can even describe rotations um, and do this all precisely using, um, using math. We're going to start with talking about scales because scales matter. Um, it matters whether you're talking about things that are micrometers or kilometers. Um, how large things are matters a lot. Um, so, for instance, this picture here, this could be showing just about anything. And if I don't tell you what the scale is, you don't know. It could look like, it could be, a, it could be water or it could be galaxies. So this is actually a galaxy um, and it's about 10,000 light, 60,000 light years in diameter. So it's huge. But without me telling you that, you don't know what you're really looking at. Here's another uh, series of pictures that emphasizes the importance of scales. So here you can see uh, the image from a scanning tunneling microscope um, and some pictures of uh, phytoplankton. Um, and then on this side, this is two colliding galaxies. But without me telling you roughly what the scales are, um, so this is, uh, this is around 10 to the negative 10th um, meters. Um, this one is something on the order of 10 to the negative fourth meters, and this is on the order of 300, uh, let's see, over, around 300 million light years from Earth. This is on the order of light years, um, the scales. So these are very different scales. Um, and, you know, it, there's nothing like having small children to teach you how important scales are. So when my... Um, my eight-year-old now gets what these things mean, but my four-year-old will say things like, you know, he is, he is 10 meters hot, tall. No, no, he's not 10 meters tall. Um, so when we talk in physics, we talk about orders of magnitude, and what we mean is something on, like a power, to, of, a power of 10. Um, so we talk about, we're always working with different units. So here for um, measures of length, measures of mass, and measures of time, you have different orders of magnitude. So if you're talking about the size of a proton on one hand, you're going to use, that's a very different order of magnitude from the, uh, the distance of the observable universe. Um, and then that covers, you know, we, the, so we talk about things being three orders of magnitude here. So the size of a proton is 10 to the negative 15th um, meters or something around that. And people are around, uh, you know, here a four-year-old around one meter high. So that means that a child is, a four-year-old child is four orders of magnitude or 15 orders of magnitude larger than the diameter of a proton. Um, so that because there's 15 powers of 10 in there. Um, and it's important to know roughly what size you're talking about before you start trying to solve a problem um, because that's gonna tell you, for instance, how accurate do you need to know what things need to be, what things do you need to consider. If you're talking about the motion of a proton, you probably do need to consider um, what happens um, when it gets bounced around by wind Whereas, for the most part, my four-year-old child is not going to be moved around by a strong wind. Another important consideration is units. Again, children really highlight how important units are. Um, where, for instance, my son the other day, my four-year-old, said that he was 90% tall. Really? I have no idea what that means. Um, so... When you, give, when you give a quantity, you know, how, how big is it? Um, you have to say not just the number, but the units. How, how big is my son? He's about one meter tall. Um, he, is, uh, he is something around 36 inches. Those are two different, wildly different numbers. I can't just say that he's 36. I have to give you the units in order for that to be a meaningful, um, an, a meaningful answer. So whenever you are giving some answer, 
but in general, it should have units. Now we do work with some numbers in physics that are unitless. You should be, but you should be very, very careful because nearly all of them are ac actually have units. An example of a unitless number is radians. Radians are technically unitless because they are a ratio of different lengths. Um, but we often use, uh, we often call them radians just to keep track of units. So when you can say talk about radians per second times seconds, and that and that will make that helps you keep track of what the units are. Um, but by default, nearly everything should have units. Um, when we talk about these fund these units, we actually have um, moved away from some of the initial definitions. Um, of time and space to using uh, the most fundamental things that we can. So for instance, the fundamental unit of time is defined as, uh, as the amount of time it takes for a transition um, between two atoms to take place. So here you can then have an atomic clock which actually times the, um, times the transitions for electrons in, uh, or vibrations in that atom and sets the clock according to that. Um, and that this here is a picture of an atomic clock where you're looking down. Um, atomic clocks are the most accurate um, way we have of measuring time to date. The meter is actually um, defined to be the list distance light travels in a, in a um, very small fraction of a second so that we are defining the meter relative to um, relative to light because, and then that fixes the speed of light in those units. Um, and that's because light and at, light is one of the most, well, we define the speed of light to be, the light, speed of light turns out to be constant and then we can um, fix other units relative to that. And this is the most precise way to define a meter. Um, and we also have SI units of mass. Um, and that can they these actually used to be um, old bars that people that were kept in a safe. But of course, the problem is that things you know can absorb water and can lose weight over add or lose weight over time, and they can get bumped around and dinged. And then the mass actually changes. So if you are defining your fundamental unit of mass to be the mass of some lead bar stored in a vault in Paris then your unit of mass is not actually constant because that lead is reacting with stuff and it is constantly changing. Um, so there are different ways to define mass. Um, and you know, for instance, right now they're working on redefining it to be, the, uh, to be based on other dimensions just to make, because there are other things that were more fundamental that we can fix to higher precision. So when we are talking about physical quantities, we are also going to be describing um, the world in models. Um, what we mean by a model is some mathematical system for describing something. Um, we, a model can be wrong, but mo and most of them actually are, but many of them are good enough for the purpose that we have at hand. So a model is a way of writing things down mathematically to describe the world. Here is an example of the model, which you may have in, encountered in previous physics or chemistry classes, the Bohr model of the atom. The Bohr model of the atom um, envisions, an, envisions an atom as being a central nucleus with electrons orbiting around it. And um, in that, we know now that that model is actually wrong. We know it's been superseded by quantum mechanics and you really have these diffuse clouds of uh, of electrons in something called a wave function, but the Bohr model of the atom is still extremely useful. Um, so we still teach the Bohr model of the atom because it is a very, it, it's going to get you many of the right answers and you, um, and you can get things good to an order of magnitude, so within a factor of 10. Um, that's what the, the expression of Bohr, an order of magnitude means. So this Bohr model of the atom is not perfectly right, but it is still useful because it's actually much easier to calculate things in than, for instance, the full quantum mechanics. So we still use the Bohr model. And this, this is really important because it, it, often when you're learning physics at the beginning, you think you're, like, you're always after the right answer. 
There isn't a right model. There are better models. But sometimes the, mo the model you should use is not the one that is the most accurate. Better is not always more accurate. Sometimes it is the one that is accurate enough and the simplicity that you get by using a, uh, by using a wrong model can still be worth it because it's much easier to do calculations in it. My catchphrase is a good physicist is a lazy physicist. You never want to work harder than you have to. So if you are calculating roughly, you're, if you're after, you know, where in the electromagnetic spectrum does the transition, uh, do the vibrational modes from water occur, you don't need to calculate everything in quantum mechanics, you can treat it as two as masses on a spring. That's good enough. Don't work harder than you have to, um, because you should save your energy. Because sometimes you have to work pretty hard. Okay, accuracy versus precision. So, accuracy means that you uh, that you get the right answer. Precision means that you get that all of your different approaches give you the same answer. And we often don't know if we have an inaccurate answer. So here, this is low accuracy. It's not actually on target, um, but you're getting the same answer over and over again. This is really hard to tease out. We at least know if we have a high precision answer, if all the time when we're measuring something, we're measuring, uh, if we're measuring almost the same thing. Um, we are often after both. We want both accuracy and precision, um, but sometimes there are trade-offs. This relates back to the previous discussion of models because, you know, sometimes you're after, you know, if you are after knowing an answer within, you know, how far, how long is the, what's the distance between Knoxville and Nashville, you don't need to know that answer to micrometers. You just need to know it to within kilometers. If you're going to do the drive, the odds are a kilometer here and there doesn't actually make a very big difference. So you might actually sacrifice precision for accuracy. All right, and that is the end of this one. We'll see you guys for, uh, for the next one, which is talking about vectors and intro introducing the mathematical model, uh, the mathematical language to describe vectors. Thank you.